Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us in this, the first uh, session of our series of workshops, which we're running uh, with across ENCODE and Euler. Um, so Euler and ENCODE have always had a rather close connection. Um, Euler were a project on ENCODE's third hackathon, um, and we've managed to maintain this connection over the years, um, including up till now, which is a very exciting time for Euler who have just as of a matter of hours ago introduced us and the rest of the world to the Ethereum Vault Connector, which I'm sure we'll be hearing much more about in the session to come. During the session, if you have any questions, please do post them in the question section at the bottom of your window and they'll be answered during the Q&A portion. Um, all that remains really is for me to thank you again for coming and to introduce you to Doug Hoyt, who I'm going to invite to the stage. Um, who'll be leading today's session on the Ethereum Vault Connector as a foundation block for modularity in DeFi. Hi Doug, over to you. Thank you. Hey Dan, thank you very much. Uh, give me one second, I will share my screen. All right. Welcome everyone. Um, today I want to talk to, about, to you about something that we've been working on at Euler for some time uh, called the Ethereum Vault Connector. And uh, before we begin into that, we will you know, do a little bit of a recap on just some properties of lending markets on Ethereum. And uh, you know, some of it may be a review for some of you, but um, it might be a little bit interesting and it's good background nevertheless. Uh, but before I begin, I just want to uh, say that um, you know, this is not my uh, work uh, alone. All of the other members of the Euler Labs team have uh, been involved in this. And uh, we're really excited to, to kind of um, unveil this to the world. Uh, so let's get started. Um, if I if I give you a question, would you rather have a hundred dollars right now or a hundred dollars from a year right now? Well, the correct answer is actually right now, right? Uh, and that reason for that is that you could take that hundred dollars, lend it out, and earn interest for the year, right? Uh, and it, you know, given a certain interest rate, you'll end up with more money, uh, like ten percent. You'd end up with one hundred ten dollars after a year, right? So. That gives sort of an equivalence between $100 from right now and $110 a year from now, right? And, you know, you've kind of heard the expression, time is money. This is where it comes from, right? The, you can almost think of uh, lending markets as being exchanges, right? Where money is actually swapped for time, right? That's sort of the, one of the main purposes of um, the financial system in general is you know, moving money or like value uh, over time and space, right? And that's kind of the primary function of it. Um, and you know, one way that you could actually consider this is uh, if you think about lending pools like Compound and Aave and um, Euler uh, as being kind of uh, AMMs, Uniswap style, for this market of time, money, right? Uh, because uh, you know, people uh, that have money and uh, you know uh, want to earn uh, exchange exchange it for uh, interest can do so uh, by depositing to a passive pool, and. Um, uh, and that's where the lending market sort of equivalence comes from. Uh, in almost all designs of lending markets, there's a requirement that accounts have to be over collateralized, right? And the, the, what that means is that whenever you take out a, a borrow, you need to make sure that you have a larger amount of collateral than the borrow size, right? And um, that's because it's, you know, on the blockchain, very difficult to uh, recover value um, outside of uh, outside of the blockchain system, right? It's, it's hard to, you, we have to assume that, um, you know, liquidations will be able to handle that. Uh, it's it's a kind of common um, notion that this is like a, a little bit unusual, right? But actually it's quite common, right? Like consider a mortgage. Uh, let's say you wanted to buy a house worth a million dollars, okay? Uh, you know, typically what you do is you save up a, do a down payment, let's say 50,000, and then you take out a $950,000 mortgage and then you buy the house, right? So after you do this, let's take a look at what your assets and debts are, right? First of all, you have a million dollar house, right? And uh, second of all, you have this obligation to the bank or the, whoever you got your mortgage from of 950,000, right? So if you look at those, um, you'll actually see that you are over collateralized, right? So as long as your house retains its value, your collateral is uh, more valuable than your debt, okay? Um, but the interesting thing is that caveat, right? As long as you're, um, as long as your house retains the value, right? It, that's, a, that's a pretty large caveat. 
let's say that the value of your house decreases to 950,000, right? Just, um, you know, the market conditions go against you, houses in your neighborhood become less valuable. Well, in fact, you'd be totally wiped out, right? Because your um, collateral is now 950,000, which is equivalent to your debt, right? And so the mortgage company should theoretically close, foreclose on you. Um, but on the other hand, let's say that your house's value rises to 1.05 million, right? So just a 5% rise in your house's value, right? If we take a look at your state at, uh, at that point, then you see that uh, if you sold the house and uh, what you'd be left with is um, double the amount that you actually started with, right? Uh, so that is interesting because um, uh, it, it exposes this concept of leverage, right? And this is, you know, one of the primary motivations for uh, borrowing and lending, not just on the blockchain, but in the financial system in general, right? Um, you know, relatively large proportion of uh, worldwide lending is, uh, you know, to create leverage positions. Um, it's a little bit confusing to talk about leverage in isolation because there's many different definitions of leverage. Um, accountants use different ones than traders and so on in some instances. But the one that I think is most useful is uh, the debt to equity measure. And that's very simple to calculate. You just uh, compute the um, equity, which is just your assets minus your, your debt or your liabilities, um, which in our, in our mortgage example is, you know, your million dollar asset minus your $950,000 mortgage. Um, and uh, once you have your equity, you can just let, uh, compute the debt divided by equity, right? So going back to our mortgage example, that's 950,000 divided by 50,000, so 19x leverage. And the th critical thing about leverage is that it magnifies both the gains and the losses, right? So this is where the, the, the analogy uh, comes, comes in, right? Why we call it leverage, right? Because you can think of it as you know, a simple machine lever uh, and, you know, such that a, a small movement on one side can create a larger movement, uh, you know, down the road due to leverage. Um, and you see, uh, just to drive it home again, is that 5% movement in our asset prices resulted in, you know, 100% gain or loss in our overall position, right? So that's quite significant. Um, on the blockchain, uh, you know, this is, um, people have been setting up leverage positions for, uh, you know, since it's, uh, since uh, the inception of lending markets. Um, but it, the very first way to do it was actually quite gas inefficient. And essentially what it was is um, users would deposit into a lending pool and then borrow, borrow as much as they could from lending pool, swap that into more collateral and then repeat, right? Redeposit that collateral that they just got and then borrow again as much as they could and swap and repeat. Um, this is what they call looping, okay? Um, a, most systems now have, uh, you know, recognize that that's not, uh, not as productive. Um, so the, there's different ways of solving this. It's making it, uh, so it doesn't use much gas and, and leverage positions can be set up in one sort of iteration of the loop. Um, and, you know, we, obviously you can do that with flash loans, right? Um, that's the, probably the most conventional way. Uh, but in general, there's like an, um, this concept of flash liquidity, which we'll talk about a little bit soon, um, that kind of generalize that a little bit and makes it so that, uh, you know, flash loans strictly aren't necessary, depending on how you look at them. Uh, like all exchanges, interest rates have two sides. Uh, there's, you know, not, as well as the borrowers, there's also the other side of the market, the depositors, right? The people who are being borrowed from, right? In, in order to incentivize the depositors to use a, a, a pool, they need to uh, earn interest, right? That's the, the, the deal of the exchange, the time on time uh, money exchange. So uh, in most systems, the way it works is that depositors earn compound interest over time, uh, and the actual interest level depends on the borrowing activity, right? So um, this is, uh, you know, to incentivize uh, more borrowing when there's little borrowing activity, and uh, if there's too much borrowing activity, to disincentivize it, right? Um, now, depending where you are in your career, you may have, uh, you know, been exposed to compound interest. Um, but if you're just starting off, I think it's a very uh, critical thing to understand, right? Because if you're at the beginning of your career, you have much more time than, you know, people uh, that are well into their career, right? So you can have a much more magnified benefit from compounding, right? So if that's one little bit of uh, life advice that you can take away from this is that, you know, leverage the time you have and uh, compounding, you know, a little bit today can end up being very uh, significant later on. Okay. And the reason for that is that compounding is an exponential uh, function, 
right? And uh, as you can see here, uh, this is the, the simple equation, right? If you've ever done any kind of accounting course or uh, you know, elementary math, I'm sure you've uh, looked at this before, but th just to recap, this is the compound interest formula, right? So we start with a particular principle, that's your initial deposit, uh, and then you multiply it by this uh, exponential term uh, and you get the new principle, right? So uh, that will, you know, typically with a positive interest rate will be larger than what you started with, right? Um, and the, the interesting thing that I want to highlight here is that uh, the number of compoundings uh, actually is uh, quite important to this, right? Uh, and if there's just one compounding uh, interval, like one compounding event within the loan interval, then we, it's what we call simple interest, right? Uh, sometimes it's also called the nominal interest rate, um, or you'll see it as like the APR of a loan instead of the APY. But uh, just to make it very simple, let's just say we start with one dollar F loan and wait for one year, and then we have um, we would plug that into the calculation, uh, uh, assuming five percent interest, and we see that we earn exactly five percent. We start with one dollar, we end up with one dollar and five cents. If we instead, let's say, have two compounding periods, uh, what that means is that after the six months, you will collect your interest, which is two point five percent. Right? That's because half of the period has elapsed, so you get half the interest. And you take that and redeposit it into the loan, effectively, and later on earn more interest on uh, the, the remainder of that, okay? So you are earning 2.5 interest on the principal for the first year, and then you're earning 2.5 interest on the principal plus that first interest payment on the second uh, interval. Uh, and the interesting thing is that if you increase the uh, compounding frequency, you get a little bit more each, uh, the more granular you make it. Right, so you see monthly, you get 5.11%, daily you get 5.12%, uh, and you know per second, uh, just a little bit more. And then you'll notice that all these values are actually converging upon a particular value, which is uh, what is sometimes called continuous interest rate. So if you take Euler's number and raise it to the interest rate, uh, you'll get that value that is being converged to. And that's what we call continuous interest. And that's why the Euler project was called uh, uh, as, it, as it was, right? Uh, one thing that we have um, noticed through our implementation research is that uh, actually computing continuous interest uh, is a little bit gas inefficient and um, you can get almost all of the benefits of accuracy by using per second compounding. So that's why, that's what we typically do. Another, in, another important thing to call out is that if you have a leveraged position, you're actually both a borrower and a depositor, right? And, and most, most designs. Um, and the reason for that is, is that your, your collateral is held, also held by the protocol, right? So uh, most protocols will be paying you interest on that uh, because you, it's a regular deposit. And um, this is actually a very common trade in traditional finance as well as, uh, as the blockchain. But um, what you can do with that is create a very leveraged position uh, with a low interest borrow and a high interest collateral, right? And then think about what happens if you don't, um, if the prices don't move, right? You will be earning, um, you will be earning high interest on the collateral, but only having to pay a low interest on the borrow, right? So you'll have a net positive interest rate. Now, the really interesting thing is that this is actually leveraged, right? Because these are on the large nominal amounts, right? You're, for example, 19x leverage, let's say. Uh, 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 although that's pretty quite aggressive and not recommended typically. Um, but if the prices of these assets don't move, you will earn this net positive leverage. Uh, the, the classic example of this trade, for example, it is um, in, in Forex is you, you borrow Japanese yen, which has, you know, pretty close, like historically pretty close to zero interest rates. Uh, and then you use that and then you, you swap that, convert that into Australian dollar or New Zealand dollar, which pay a very high interest and you sit and earn that, uh, that very large leverage interest, right? But as we saw, if prices move against you, leverage can magnify the gains or losses. So you have to be quite careful. Uh, and sometimes you might hedge the exposure of that. Uh, moving into sort of more of the implementation uh, details of what we've done, uh, let's talk a little bit about the 4626 standard, okay? This is a uh, popular standard for yield bearing vaults. And uh, at Euler, we think this is a very, um, you know, well-designed standard, and uh, we think it'll be, you know, even more important than it is today. And we're quite excited about uh, about about the standard. 
um, you know, for the same reason that uh, ERC-20 was exciting, right? It means that um, all kinds of different protocols, applications can be written and internally work their own way, but still interact with other different protocols, um, you know, that are coded in a different way. Uh, and, you know, there's not really any question about whether a token works in a protocol, uh, you know, with some exceptions on Ethereum, because it, they all follow the ERC-20 standard, right? So that's why we think standards are powerful and we're, we're building uh, our system with ERC-4626 in mind from the beginning. Uh, the one sort of slight difference of our with our take is uh, this distinction about active and passive vaults. Um, Typically, the way an ERC-4626 vault works is you, you deposit into it, and then it has some kind of strategy encoded in its, uh, in its logic, right? It will go and, you know, reinvest that in some other assets, uh, you know, maybe LP on some exchanges or, or, or you know, do whatever, whatever the designers of the vault did, you know, thought would be a, a good uh, strategy, right? Uh, and then when you withdraw, it, you know, tries to sell off those assets or uh, however, however it works internally to be able to repay you. Right. But the key thing is that the vault is deciding the um, investment profile. Lending markets are a bit different than that because, as we've said, it also uh, it is a two sided market. Right. So, in this case, we call these uh, passive vaults. Okay. Um, rather than the vault deciding what to do with the deposit, uh, there is uh, it, it's the deposit sits in the vault and waits for another party, the borrower, to come and take it up. Right. Uh, and they will then later on repay it and pay uh, the interest along with that, right? So, but the critical thing is that the, the vault is not uh, deciding on uh, how the funds should be distributed, right? Um, and uh, the way that ERC 4626 works is that it's backwards compatible, okay? That's, a, I think, a very important property. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, standards um, try to uh, create their own new takes on things and aren't as successful. But I think that's one of the important little bits is to build on backwards, maintain backwards compatibility as much as possible. Uh, so when you deposit into a 4626 vault, you get back these ERC-20 compatible tokens, right? And the vault itself is the ERC-20 token contract. And these are, uh, these are usually called shares, okay? And uh, they represent a claim on the assets held by the vault, like owned by the vault. Um, and one thing that we think is important is that, uh, when you deposit and you get your shares, that number of shares does not by itself change, right? In other words, it's not a rebasing token. Um, we've seen a lot of problems and we've experienced a lot of problems with, uh, tokens that do that, right? Um, like stake ether is a very good, a common example, but, uh, if you just hold a stake ether balance, it will kind of grow over time, right? Like if you just walk, sit in your wallet and watch it every, every period, period, it'll grow, increase, right? Uh, that causes a lot of integration problems. So we think it's important that they are not rebasing tokens. Um, and additionally, we've decided that we, you know, to the extent we can, we will not support rebasing tokens, similar to Uniswap and many other projects. But instead, the way that uh, interest works is that when the interest is accrued, every share becomes redeemable for a larger amount of the underlying asset, right? So that's, that's how interest is paid out. Got this? So your number of shares does not change, but they become more and more valuable over time. Um, and how much more valuable? Well, that's uh, determined by what is uh, kind of informally called the exchange rate. Uh, and it's a very simple formula. It just takes a look at the assets held by the vault. In other words, like, you know, if the vault could be totally sold off right now and refunded to all of the depositors, what would be the amount that there, there is, right? Uh, well, that consists of the current cash. That's like the actual token balance held by the vault at any one time in addition to the total outstanding borrows, right? Which will need to be paid back at some point in the future, right? So those are the total assets of the vault. The exchange rate, you simply divide that by the number of outstanding shares, right? So that, that's, a, that's a, an important little aspect, um, just to, to understand what, what people talk about exchange rate, what they mean, right? Um, okay, so the concept that we are uh, espousing right now is to use vaults for everything, okay? So uh, not only are the borrowed assets ERC-4626, but also the uh, cl deposited collateral assets are 4626 in our configuration, okay? Um, and, you know, this isn't, uh, this is in some sense, is quite um, uh, a continuation of the existing system. Like, um, you know, the compound, for example, you can think of it being like that too, right? Each quote unquote vault is a C token. 
The only difference is that we have tried to make our implementations uh, and you know, our uh, advocating for implementations to be as closely compatible with ERC 4626 as possible. If you've, uh, if you've uh, been checking out the diagrams, you've probably noticed a uh, problem uh, with this design is if all these vaults are independent, how do you prevent a user from withdrawing collateral after taking a borrow, right? Like uh, in, in, in the case um, uh, where they do that, then the other vault, the, the, the borrowed asset would no longer be able to uh, seize that or uh, reacquire it in any sort of liquidation scenario, right? So we need to solve this. And what that means is that vaults need to coordinate in some way, right? There needs to be some kind of connector, okay? So uh, that's what we're uh, unveiling today. Uh, and we'll have some resources that you can read about and uh, in fact, check out the code uh, on GitHub right now. Uh, but what we're calling it is the Ethereum Vault Connector or the EVC for short. And um, what we like, uh, what one of our goals with the EVC was to make it as non-invasive as possible. And the idea behind that is that um, we ideally would like to make it as easy as possible to integrate with um, uh, any existing ERC-48626 code base uh, as we can. So to accomplish that, we've created this minimal integration layer uh, that can be incorporated to existing vault systems. Uh, and in the following workshop, you'll have a little bit more of a taste of that. Um, but uh, uh, we won't go over the exact like code level integrations uh, at this point. But the idea is that you should be able to take um, a for, you know existing vault and kind of plug it in via this EVC system into the wider uh, liquidity uh, uh, of the of the system. Um, yeah, the way it works is that EVC tracks what we call the collateral set for each account. So when you connect to the EVC, or when you want to use an uh, EV, the EVC or uh, EVC compatible vault for borrowing purposes, uh, you can uh, choose some subset of the vaults that you're interested in posting as a collateral, right? Uh, and this is stored inside the EVC itself. And now the EVC has a record that this particular user um, has registered these as a collateral, okay? And then uh, similarly, when you want to take out a borrow, you add it to another set, the controller set, okay? And um, in, in most cases, there can only be one controller at any given time, right? And uh, in fact, that's true, uh, that's true in the general sense, except that we transiently allow multiple controllers to uh, exist, but as long as the, um, at the end of the transaction, only one controller exists. So it's easiest to think about uh, the, the um, property enforced by the EVC is that each account has only one controller and, but potentially multiple collaterals, okay? So the, the, the really key thing about the controller is that uh, you are kind of, um, when you use it, submitting your account to this controller and giving it, uh, I mean, this is why we talk about controller, but you're giving it control over your account, right? So obviously, um, if we, yeah, go to the next slide here. Obviously, if you do set it as a controller, um, you should make sure that it's, you know, well audited and, uh, and, and trusted, right? But this is, this is the same as any regular lending market, right? Um, if you are, you know, putting your assets into it, then you are trusting its implementation and, uh, admins if they exist and so forth, uh, and to, to be able to, you know, to give it back to you when you need it, right? Or when you request it. Um, the interesting thing about the, uh, controller is, is that, um, you cannot yourself, uh, release it. it it's, um, it, the, the controller itself releases it, uh, releases the, um, the, the control over you. Okay. Uh, vaults can, um, you know, and probably should allow, uh, the, um, account to request release of the control, but um, but the critical bit is that you can't just turn off a controller, right? Because if you could just turn off a controller, then um, you could uh, you know withdraw your collaterals without repaying your borrows, right? So that's the that's the nature of the of the controller. Uh, and the other the other trust dimension is the vaults themselves, right? they have to be able to inspect the list of collaterals that the user has chosen and determine if it is uh, acceptable or not, right? Uh, because obviously, you know, the uh, 
not everything could just be chosen as collateral, right? Obviously, it could be some kind of malicious token or uh, valueless or man manipulatable token. So not every vault will want to accept every collateral as a um, as uh, uh, able to borrow assets from it. Okay. So this is the other trust dimension, right? Is that vaults themselves have to figure out what collateral set is acceptable to them, right? And there's uh, many different policies that, uh, that that vaults can do to um, to implement with that, uh, and we'll go over that more in a future workshop. Um, and, and yeah, the the as I was saying, the trust dimension is that the collateral vaults have to depend on these. Uh, or sorry, the controller vault needs to uh, depend on the controller of, uh, collateral vaults acting honestly, right? So, and they also need to integrate correctly with the EBC, right? So all, the vaults in the system um, have to kind of work together and collaborate. Uh, and there's those two, these two different trust dimensions, right? User to controller and controller to collaterals. One other minor edge case that's a little bit interesting is that if a uh, vault doesn't accept any collaterals, then obviously no borrowing is allowed uh, on the um, on the vault itself. Uh, and in this case, you know, you uh, will not be able to set up uh, leverage positions and earn interest on the collateral, right? Sometimes it's called like a no rehypothecation sort of use case. Uh, and, you know, obviously it makes performing carry trades um, uh, not actually uh, uh, possible. But uh, this is not a, a useless situation. In fact, it, it still can be quite valuable for, under many circumstances um, because the vault itself can still be used as collateral, right? So the vault might itself not allow borrowing, but other vaults that do could um, allow it as a collateral, right? And the reason you would do that is, of course, if you did wanted to forego your interest that you would earn on the collateral so that it would be more uh, guaranteed that you would be able to withdraw when you need it, right? In other words, it wouldn't be loaned out when you need it. Um, the EBC is kind of designed along the lines of um, uh, authentication and authorization, right? It's a, it's a separation of concerns. Uh, you know, the EBC is not a, a very large code base, but it implements some very critical functions in the um, implementation of a vault, okay? And what we've tried to do is draw the line uh, where the EBC is responsible for the authentication, okay? In a future workshop, we'll talk about like the ramifications of that, um, and all of the interesting things that this enables. Um, but for now, you can just think of the EVC as tracking, you know, which account um, is requesting the action. Uh, sorry, I think there's a typo there. But yeah, which account is requesting the action. Um, and then the vaults themselves are responsible for the authorization, right? So is the account that the EVC has determined is requesting the action actually allowed to perform that action, right? Uh, you know, the most uh, obvious way, uh, like thing that I might check is to make sure that that account actually has, for example, a balance, right? If you request to withdraw a hundred tokens from a, a vault, but uh, you only have 50 in your account, like you, that's the only the amount that you're actually eligible for, that operation should be rejected, okay? So uh, when we talk a little bit about the authentication versus authorization, this is the separation. EVC handles auth n and uh, vaults handle auth dead. Um, just because it's kind of a critical component of this design, um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how the authentication system, uh, the ramifications of it, and how it works uh, right now. Um, and it has to do with this special use case of uh, liquidation, right? In this particular case, what has happened is that a controller has determined that um, that a user is in violation of their loan agreement, right? So whatever that means, the, the policy is in fact up to the controller vault, but whatever that means, it is determined that, uh, you know, this user is in violation and therefore some of the collateral should be seized, okay? Uh, in order to, you know, make this right. In other words, uh, to most likely to swap it back into more of the token of the controller vault to repay the loan, right? Uh, now, the interesting thing is that uh, because of the EVC and Vault auth and auth z split is, is that the uh, controller vault doesn't even, uh, sorry, the collateral vault doesn't even need to understand that a liquidation is actually happening, okay? Because the user has submitted themselves to the control of the controller vault, 
the controller vault is actually able to make an, a request on the user's behalf to the collateral vault. So it, it simply needs to do a withdraw, right? By impersonating the original user, okay? Um, and this is like the most, uh, I would say, fundamental version of the authentication split because um, the, the really nice aspect of it is that uh, vaults themselves, neither the, uh, the, the collateral vaults that is, don't need to understand anything about a liquidation flow or need to do anything special for it, right? And also furthermore, uh, the actual mechanics of liquidation are not specified anywhere in the protocol, okay? It's, uh, it's, it's up to the agreement between the controller vault and the collateral vault what to do, right? In, in the typical case, it will just be issuing, you know, some kind of withdraw, right, to see some of the collateral um, uh, on behalf of the user. But, you know, there, there might be some different functions, for example, like NFTs might, or, or other non-standard assets might have different um, liquidation mechanisms that are required. Um, there's a lot more to the EBC, uh, and we're going to go over it in a, the, a future workshop. Uh, but another really th interesting and important thing to understand right now, in my opinion, is that the EBC also allows you to uh, perform multi-call operations, right? Uh, most likely you're familiar with other existing multi-call contracts. Um, you know, the idea behind it is essentially that you uh, create a transaction and call into these multi-call contracts, uh, contract with a list of other transactions you would actually like to execute, and it loops over them and does them all uh, on its, uh, you know, in the same uh, atomic transaction, okay? Um, and there's various uses for that. You know, number one, you know, might be uh, more gas efficient to do that. Uh, number two, you might want, want to do something actually atomically so that it can't be, you know, multiple operations can't be broken up in the middle and have other malicious things inserted in the middle. Um, and also just a simple better UX for EOAs. That just, I mean, that is regular Ethereum accounts that are contracts. You know, uh, to set up some of these complicated positions might be many different uh, actions interacting with many different vaults, right? So a bad user experience would be to force the um, UIs to create uh, separate transactions, right? And then the user would have to approve and um, uh, execute each one of them. So uh, in the EVC's concept, these multi-call operations are called batches and they're effectively just lists of calls. Uh, and uh, the idea behind that is that um, uh, the EBC does not actually enforce which vaults are being called, right? Uh, it, it's not like you can only perform the same operation, uh, the multiple operations on the same vault. No, you can actually call any arbitrary contracts in these, okay? And there's um, some different security ramifications of that that are described in our white paper and so on, which is public as of today. But um, uh, the, it's a very powerful primitive because you know not only could you call the same vault multiple times, you could call multiple different vaults like independently, or you could call completely unrelated contracts, right? You could actually perform swapping and wrapping and whatever else you need to perform uh, to, to uh, establish the desired position. Um, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go into more detail of, of that shortly. But one thing that I like to say is that the EVC is kind of like a glorified multi-call, right? Like probably the most, uh, the biggest complexity uh, of it is, uh, you know, number one, maintaining those controller and collateral sets, but also performing, you know, all of this different multi-call advanced authentication um, concepts, which are, uh, you know, kind of based on our experience about what, we, what you need to create a, a, a really good, UX and flexible system. Um, and, and another important aspect of, of that, of the batches, is this concept of liquidity deferral. Um, and uh, this is where, as I was saying, the you know, flash loans aren't strictly required to set up positions on uh, the EVC system and related vaults, um, because the way that when uh, liquidity checking works on a batch is that the actual um, status of an account, you know, whether it's in violation of its, uh, of its uh, agreements with its controller are only checked at the end of the batch, okay? So the, the useful thing about that is that leverage positions can be set up, um, you know, without any looping or flash loans, okay? Uh, but uh, not only that, is uh, any sort of combinations of actions, you know, rebalancing, uh, wrapping, anything like that, um, can transiently leave accounts in a violation state as long as they solve it by the end of the batch. Okay, uh, and, and we'll, we'll get into the status of the, the, these uh, these deferrals in more detail. 
but uh, this also includes things like um, vault specific conditions, like vaults might want to implement some borrow and supply caps and so on. Um, all of those can be uh, you know, transiently violated as long as they are solved at the end of the batch, okay? Um, one, uh, one slightly tricky feature of the EVC that I wanted to talk about today, just because um, it will be very useful in the next workshop, uh, and also because it's, uh, you know, a, a, a understanding it is fundamental to understanding uh, the EVC vault integration, is this feature called call for EVC, okay? Uh, we, we call this sort of a callback pattern. And it's a little bit unusual, uh, uh, but it, it has some really nice properties. And um, as I said, it's very non-invasive to add to your, uh, to your own program. It's basically just a modifier you can put on your, your functions and then get all the benefits that I'll explain. But uh, <clears throat> excuse me. the way it works is that uh, when you call into a vault, um, the vault doesn't actually necessarily know if it's inside of a, uh, a batch operation, right? Uh, I, I should say that, uh, it's important for vaults to be able to work in two modes, right? One where you call a vault directly, you know, you just directly call deposit on a vault, right? Uh, or you go through the EVC's multi-call operations, right? So in other words, you call into the EVC and you uh, give it a list of items in your batch and you know, one of those calls into a vault, right? And one of the really desirable properties that we've tried to enable is that make it very simple for, for vault um, creators to not have to worry about that, right? Uh, because remember that the EVC is handling the authentication. So this is a little kind of being outsourced uh, and then vaults don't have to worry about it so much as long as they follow this pattern, okay? So the idea is that uh, when you are called directly, uh, you will actually, as a vault, call into the EVC and uh, basically invoke a mini batch with uh, one item where you call back into yourself with the original action from the user. Right, uh, and that sounds really weird, but it has a really nice property in that um, you can perform whatever actions and then um, rely on the fact that the account's health uh, or any other of these uh, liquidity deferrals or status checks as we call them, uh, will get um, enforced after the call, right? So you can code your vault in the same way in both cases of if you're being invoked directly or via the EVC, okay? Uh, and yeah, in, in, in uh, the next workshop, you will um, uh, add, uh, you know, integrate this with a, a vault uh, and, and hopefully see how uh, nicely it slots into most, most workflows. Uh, yeah, as I was saying, the EVC is, um, EVC is a very uh, simple contract. Uh, well, sorry, <laughs> I'm gonna take the time. It's a very small contract but we've packed quite a bit in there. And um, I would say that so far, this description has only scratched the surface of what the EVC enables. Um, although we've hit most of the main topics, there's a lot of interesting ramifications. Uh, and uh, I hope to see you next time in the, uh, in the, in the following workshops and explain them in more detail. Uh, yeah, and yeah, one other thing is the, that having, having all these different, different vaults is uh, kind of a, a network of liquidity. And uh, we'll explain we'll explain a little bit more about the ramifications of that. But we think it's quite powerful, and we're really excited uh, to 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 unveil this to the world. If you want to read more about it right now, uh, we've enabled the uh, we've um, uh, created these links evc.wtf uh, that has uh, the documentation and the white paper and links to everything else. Um, and there's uh, the, also these links to our GitHub repos, which are public today. Um, there is a uh, bounty system, uh, like bug, bug bounties and uh, rewards also for uh, workshop participation in the next workshops. So please check out those, um, those sites for more details. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, happy to answer any questions uh, right now. Thanks, Doug. Um, if members of the audience want to ask any questions, you can post them in the chat or is there kind of des des uh, dedicated uh, questions space where you can upvote and downvote questions? Yeah, my apologies. I wasn't reading the chat so much uh, while I was presenting, so I, I might have missed a couple. Uh, please paste them again if you. Uh... Uh, right, so first question I see is uh, if it's permissionless to create vaults. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, the, the EVC has no 
central coordinator or admin or controller. It's a what we call a public good, entirely uh, non-upgradable. Anyone can create a vault, and uh, it's really up to the the users whether they want to you know trust that as a controller and also other vaults whether they want to trust those your vaults as collateral. So um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about those trust boundaries in the future. Um, Next question, is ERC, EVC intended to be compliant with ERC 4337? I'm sorry, I'm looking that up right now. Oh, the, the account extraction, yeah. This is, a, this is an interesting, this is an interesting one um, because um, EVC actually, there's a, lot, a large amount of overlap in my opinion with um, account abstraction and the EVC. Just like all, all, all multi calls, right? Like if you did have a good um, account abstraction system, which like hopefully we will in the future, then um, a lot of the things you would do with multi call are no longer relevant. So there definitely is some overlap, but we haven't specifically designed it to be compatible with any of the account abstraction proposals. Um, but uh, it's quite a flexible contract, so I think most likely uh, it will play pretty well with it. But uh, yeah, well, it's a good question. We'll look into it. Um, next question I see from Alex, it seems that every vault has to whitelist the collateral, which could be gas inefficient. Have you guys thought about a solution to whitelist slash enable collateral for all vaults? Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, so which vaults that a, um, sorry, which collaterals that a vault accepts is up, totally up to itself, right? So a very, um, you know, a uh, naive vault might just be able to, might just choose anything as absolutely anything as collateral, right? Um, the first problem with that, of course, is that how you price this collateral, right? How do you know what the value of the collateral actually is? And, uh, you know, that, that started just pushing the problem to the pricing, right? Like, uh, because, you know, if it's just a token that I create right now and there's no Uniswap markets or anything like that, then, um, you know, how am I going to get a good value, uh, actual price for it, right? Not even to say, not even to mention that the vault itself could be malicious, right? So that, that's why I say that would be quite a naive vault. Um, however... Yes, we have thought of ways to, um, you know, automatically accept newly uh, like vaults as long as there is some sort of trusted pricing feed for it, right? Like, for example, a vault might want to might want to allow any sort of collateral that has a chain link recently updated chain link price feed, for example, right? But uh, really, the policy is up to the vault. Yeah. Uh, next question from Zach: uh, Can we use EBC in cross chain situations? Um, Yes, uh, it should be possible. We, we've put a little bit of thought into this, uh, and you know, there's nothing to stop it from being used in cross-chain situations. Um, but uh, it, it itself doesn't out, um, provide any explicit cross-chain uh, features, right? But we, we have thought a little bit about um, you know how to the best way to bridge tokens, for example, so that they can be used uh, on different chains. But uh, still, more work to do on that. Um, I'm just going to paste one over from Matthias in the question section. Ah, uh, right. Uh, so on EVC WTF, there's uh, a mention of workshops. When will those be available? Um, I believe that uh, I believe that um, we will put the videos recordings up when they're ready. Um, so probably relatively soon after this is uh, published. You know, just giving them time to like encode it and whatever. Uh, but also there is going to be more details for the next workshop because there will actually be uh, bounty and participations uh, or like, uh, yeah, the tasks to, to accomplish and rewards for people that do. Um, so I would say just uh, sit tight. We'll have it up very soon. Uh, or if anyone else from my team has any follow-up links. But yeah, there's uh, no, no homework for this uh, <laughs> workshop. Uh, it'll be for the next one. Yeah, thanks, Matia. So yeah, those are those are placeholders for for these workshops today. I think I think that's about, I think you've been, you've been fairly exhaustive and answered all of the uh, all the questions that Doug. Um, might give people one last chance to ask any burning questions, but of course we'll be seeing them again in upcoming workshops. So there'll be plenty of opportunities to ask questions. I'll just give you a moment to ask any questions that you might have, and then we can wrap up. Yeah, the, okay, I see a couple more questions uh, rolling in here. Um, uh, from Talant, I believe you guys, I bet you guys looked at Morpho Blue. Where do you beat them? Uh, it's a 
Good question. We we have looked at Morpho Blue, and uh, yeah, we think they have a very interesting take on it. Um, I would say that you know one of the things that we do enable is like is the the uh, traditional uh, ability to um, actually earn interest on your deposited collateral, right? Like what I was talking about, the carry trade is enabled by that, right? So the the, the compound model. Uh, this is one thing that Morpho Blue is forgone, which uh, personally I think is not. Uh, is not the best decision, and uh, I think one thing that um, one thing that uh, uh, Euler provides is uh, you know a permissionless, permissionless modular framework like Morpho Blue without jettisoning some of the important things that uh, you know the traditional compound pool model provided. Um, but uh, yeah, that's it's a good question, and um, you know I think maybe one day we'll have a, a side by side uh, comparison uh, to Morpho Blue. Next, next question is: uh, Can you explain why rebasing isn't good? Uh, sure. In fact, uh, some time ago, I wrote an article: um, the perils of rebasing tokens, and it went into like in, in, in big detail. Uh, I'm sure we can pull up a link there. But um, you know, the, the the biggest problem is that uh, you know, if a contract records your balance for something, uh, it it might you know. Uh, want to actually rely on that as being a stable indicator of something, right? Uh, in in um, yes, uh, some other excellent comments in the, in the chat here. Yeah. Rebasing tokens are difficult because this is from Dakota, because in some applications you need to know the value of the asset, and if it's constantly changing, that's challenging. Yeah, uh, I mean, one of the things is that um, yeah, the, 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 thank you, Matia. That, that's a that's a good link, but. Uh, you know, one of the things is that, um, in particular for lending markets with uh, state ether, uh, the lending market itself has a balance in the state ether contract, right? And that actually increases every time there's a payout from the you know the Lido rewards, right? So uh, that's all well and good because the the cash, the unloaned out amount, increases, which in you know the the traditional compound model and Euler one model um, is actually uh, accrued directly to the pool, which therefore proportionally goes to the uh, shareholder, like the holders of the shares, right? Uh, the problem with that though, is that um, you could actually uh, sandwich those price updates uh, or, uh, and borrow everything out from the pool in the same transaction and then apply the, the action that would cause the balance to rebase, which would increase your balance, not the pool, and then redeposit. Uh, or sorry, repay your, your your borrowed amount. So you'd basically be siphoning off the rewards that should have gone to the um, to the estate deeds or depositors um, yourself. Uh, you know, yes, like just in time lending kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So uh, there's various solutions to that, and um, we've actually kind of gone a little bit of a different way in our multiple rotations. Uh, you know, first of all, because we're not supporting rebasing tokens. Uh, uh, to the extent we can. Uh, we'll talk about that more in the future. Okay, I think that might be, might be it for, for the question. Stuff. Um, thank you so much for the absolutely fascinating run through uh, what you guys have been working on recently. Um, and thank you all for, for, for coming. We can happily say that the first building block of Euler V2 is here and expected to launch later this year. But of course, you can learn much more about it in our exciting upcoming workshops. So join us on Tuesday, the 16th of January for Kasper Pavlovsky um, and his workshop on how to integrate ERC 4626 volts with the Ethereum Vault Connector. Um, and if you're worried that you're not going to see Doug for a bit, he will be back on Thursday, the 18th um, to take us through the unique features of the Ethereum Vault Connector. So I'm really looking forward to seeing um, Doug once again then um i hope we can just thank him again all together and i wish you a very good day yep thank you very much dan and thanks to encode for setting this up and thanks everyone for your attention